Hi there, I'd like to talk to you about microbial growth in this segment. And we're talking primarily about uh, uh, meeting the physical and chemical requirements for growth so that we can successfully grow microorganisms, bacteria specifically, in a laboratory situation. And I'm going to keep it really simple, you guys. So let's go ahead and begin by defining what do we mean by the term microbial growth. Well, it refers to an increase in the number of cells, not little cells growing into big cells, but rather an increase in the uh, population. So two cells dividing to form four to eight to 16 and, and so forth. So microbial growth refers to an increase in the number of bacterial cells. Uh, now let's go ahead and talk about, um, make a brief list and talk about some physical requirements for growth. Now we can divide bacteria into three groups. Uh, the basis of this division being what is their preferred or even in some cases required range of temperatures for optimal growth. And these are going to be ranges, all right? So most bacteria within one of these ranges, um, maybe they prefer a, a little um, to the warmer end or the cooler end, but typically they will grow within this range, right? The first category, um, they are known as psychrophiles, and that means uh, lovers of cold. And these bacteria can grow anywhere in temperatures from below zero. I've um, read uh, possibly as low as minus 15 degrees Celsius up to a maximum of about 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, so the bacteria that would be responsible for the spoilage of food in our refrigerator, for example, they would fall into this category. Now, as you look at the uh, temperatures for the next category, the mesophiles, you'll see that these are not um, uh, fixed categories. There, there could be some overlap between them. Uh, mesophiles typically can grow in temperatures that range anywhere from 15 degrees Celsius up to a maximum of about 45 degrees Celsius. So human normal flora and many bacterial human pathogens, they're going to fall into the mesophile group. And then the third category, um, they're known as thermophiles, which means heat lovers, and they can uh, grow in temperatures that range anywhere from maybe a low of about 45 degrees Celsius up to a high of Oh, 65 degrees Celsius. These are the bacteria that we would find in um, um, uh, hot sulfurous areas, for example, um, vents under the uh, surface of the ocean where uh, volcano volcanoes are releasing some gases. All right, so when we're going to grow bacteria in a laboratory, it would be good to know which of those categories that they fall into so that we can provide the correct temperature for optimum growth. Um, all right, usually the, um, I've got a note here. Yeah, you've got it in your notes as well. It says uh, usually maximum and minimum temperature range are gonna be no more than 30 degrees Celsius apart. Uh, we've got some terms there, um, minimum growth temperature. That would be the lowest temperature at which growth can occur. Um, optimum growth temperature, favoritist temperature, and then maximum uh, growth temperature would be the highest temperature at which growth can occur. All right, that takes us to pH. So we need to understand the pH requirements of a bacterium to successfully grow it in the laboratory. Now, I believe I've made this statement before. We see less versatility, less diversity uh, for this particular requirement in the bacteria than we do with some others. Uh, most bacteria require the pH to be pretty close to neutral. Now, there are definitely exceptions on, on the acidic and on the alkaline uh, side of the pH scale, but most bacteria are going to prefer the pH be somewhere between six and a half and seven and a half on the uh, pH scale. Now, knowing this, uh, and actually even before people really understood it, they used this, um, uh, this concept uh, to preserve foods in the absence of refrigeration. For example, if we add vinegar uh, to cucumbers and do some other things as well, a lot of salt as well, um, we can uh, preserve cucumbers uh, that maybe were plentiful in the summer into uh, to the winter months, right? And that's going to, uh, the acidity and also the uh, high salt content is going to discourage bacterial growth. Uh, but we may find that some fungi may be able to, uh, to grow in those conditions. 
All right. Um, now, still on the topic of pH, when we are growing bacteria in the laboratory, we're growing them in a very finite space, either in some uh, broth or solid media in a test tube or uh, perhaps some solid media in a, a petri plate. And sometimes uh, we need a little more time to be able to um, observe their growth and, and perhaps some other reaction that we're looking for. And so uh, most microbiological media contain what's known as a pH buffer. And this is a substance that slows down changes in the pH. And that's just to allow the bacteria to grow for a longer period of time so that we can make our observations. Okay, uh, you've got some examples of um, what buffers might be in your outline. Okay, let's talk now about, and I'm going to try to insert a slide about here. Uh, let's talk now about a phenomenon known as plasmolysis. Hopefully you have that slide, or hopefully I did get that slide inserted into the lecture, but you should have it in your notes in front of you. Was we can define plasmolysis as the osmotic loss of water that occurs when we place a bacterial cell in a hypertonic environment. Hypertonic meaning, of course, uh, that we have a higher concentration of salts or sugars in the environment, and that is relative to the concentration of salts in the interior of the cell. So if you take a look at those diagrams in the first scenario, we have um, a bacterial cell that's been placed in an isotonic environment, and we are going to see um, uh, some water leaving the cell and some water entering the cell through osmosis uh, or diffusion. And um, this is going to occur in approximately equal quantities. However, in the second uh, diagram, if you place that same bacterium in a hypertonic environment and they put it in a 10% sodium chloride environment, um, we're going to see a huge loss of water from the cell through osmosis this is um, an attempt to reach equilibrium with the environment. And um, as the cell is losing water, the um, plasma membrane will literally uh, be pulled away from the cell wall and most of the water from the cytoplasm is gonna be um, lost and this will uh, have a fatal effect on the cell. So that's called plasmolysis. All right, knowing this, we can use this principle to preserve foods, for example, um, uh, in times, again, when refrigeration was not um, available, uh, people would salt and dry meat and fish for use in, uh, in the winter, for example, when those foods might not be so readily available. Uh, there are some bacteria that can uh, tolerate and, and actually in some cases even require uh, saline environment. You've got a couple of um, uh, terms written in your notes. First of all, the extreme halophiles, those are bacteria that actually require highly saline environments. Uh, and halobacterium, the genus of bacteria named halobacterium, that's an example of a, um, a halophile. And the facultative halophiles, like for example, the genus Staphylococcus and Micrococcus for that matter, they can tolerate, they maybe don't prefer, but they can survive in uh, higher than average saline uh, concentrations. Okay, so let's now go ahead and talk about some chemical requirements for growth. Uh, and I'm just gonna touch lightly on these, you guys. First on the list would be carbon, and everybody that lives on this planet requires carbon um, in a form that they're able to utilize, able to metabolize successfully and incorporate into, uh, into their cells. And this carbon is going to be used to synthesize all of the organic components of the cells, like cell walls and cytoplasm and, and many other things. Uh, the... Um, Next group, I'm going to kind of lump some together, and that would be, uh, or those would be the elements nitrogen, sulfur, and phosphorus. Well, we need those elements to make nifty things like DNA and RNA and the highly energetic molecule known as ATP. And uh, while we're on this topic, I wanted to talk a little bit about bacteria that are referred to as 
nitrogen fixers, all right? And I think you've got an example in your note, in your notes, a genus named Rhizobium, for example. That's a bacterium that's capable of this process known as nitrogen fixation. Now, what these bacteria do is this. They convert atmospheric nitrogen into, into a form that they can use and subsequently plants can use. Now, our atmosphere is largely made of nitrogen, yes? And so we are breathing nitrogen in and exhaling nitrogen uh, as well. And the thing is, you guys, is that even with all of that nitrogen available in our atmosphere, our cells aren't capable of incorporating nitrogen in that form into our cells to build the uh, components of cells that we require. So we depend on these nitrogen fixing bacteria. They convert nitrogen into a, a form that plants can use like um, nitrate, nitrite, even ammonia in some cases. And then we obtain nitrogen in a form that we can use either by eating those plants directly or eating somebody else that ate plants like when you eat a hamburger. Okay, so that's how we get nitrogen in a form that we can use. Now, a little more about these nitrogen fixers, and you should have a couple other photos um, in your outline. Uh, and um, some of these nitrogen fixers are just free living in soil. They're just scattered um, throughout the soil, while others have evolved into a symbiotic relationship with a group of plants known as the legumes. And these bacteria, they will live in nodules in the roots of these plants. Um, and because these nitrogen fixing bacteria are so efficient at what they do, they allow these plants to be um, super protein producers. And so that's why legumes, which would include things like um, lentils, peas, beans, peanuts, uh, they are so high in protein. It's because of these nitrogen fixing bacteria that live in nodules in their roots. Uh, one of the um, photos is showing you a cross section of one of these root nodules and you can see all the little uh, uh, bacteria that are stained either blue or um, purple I guess in that photo. And then the one below it shows um, they actually pulled a legume out of the soil or whatever they were growing it in, washed everything away and then you can see all of those nodules uh, and those all contain nitrogen fixing bacteria. All right, we're still talking about chemical requirements for growth. Next on my list would be what we call trace elements, and uh, these are minerals that are required in small quantities. It could be parts per million or even um, parts per billion. Um, now, most of these uh, trace elements we're going to obtain in um, water. So when we prepare microbiological media in the laboratory, um, when we add water um, to the process to make that media, we're adding our trace elements. I mean things like um, zinc and iron and copper and uh, molybdenum and selenium. Those are just a few. Uh, so trace elements are minerals required in very actually small quantities. All right, let's move on to oxygen. Uh, bacteria may have... Um, uh, one relationship or another with um, with oxygen. Now, some of these terms we've already defined, but let's go ahead and, and work through them together. Um, first of all, are aerobes, and those are bacteria that require oxygen to survive. Um, oxygen is a necessary part of their metabolic pathways. Uh, next would be the facultative anaerobes. Now, those bacteria, they can grow either in the presence or in the absence of oxygen. Now, metabolism uh, aerobic metabolism, so metabolism using oxygen is more efficient, produces more ATP than anaerobic respiration. So these facultative anaerobes, they're going to grow better uh, if oxygen is present. Uh, obligate anaerobes, those are bacteria that not only cannot use oxygen, they are poisoned by its presence. Next would be aerotolerant anaerobes. Okay, so um, obligate anaerobes can't use oxygen, poisoned by its presence. Aerotolerant anaerobes cannot use oxygen, but they are not poisoned if it is present. And then finally are what we refer to as microaerophilic bacteria. That word literally means uh, little air lovers, meaning lower concentrations of um, oxygen. And um, 
these bacteria require concentrations of oxygen that are lower than we find in our atmosphere, which is, I don't know, 21, 22% oxygen. Uh, they prefer, typically they prefer concentrations of oxygen that range between two and 10%. And those environments would be found, um, for example, in the soil. Uh, the further we go below the surface of the soil, the lower the oxygen concentrate in possibly aquatic environments like um, uh, in the sediment, right, where uh, the water meets the land. Uh, that would be another example of an environment where we might find microaerophilic bacteria. Okay, let's move on to organic growth factors. And we're referring to um, vitamins and enzymes that the bacteria is unable to synthesize on its own. Uh, so we need to understand, uh, if we're trying to grow a particular species of bacteria, we need to know enough about it to know um, if it is unable to produce uh, a particular enzyme or enzymes or vitamins and make sure that those are provided in the microbiological media that we select for its uh, cultivation. All right, let's move on to uh, the growth of bacterial cultures. And I'm going to try to um, insert another slide here. Okay, hopefully that worked. Um, if not, you've got it in your outline. Uh, but, um, and that diagram is a bacterial growth curve and we'll get to that in just a minute. So what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna take a look at what happens to a population of bacterial cells um, when we, let's say, inoculate a tube of uh, triptych soy broth uh, and place it in the incubator in the laboratory. So what's gonna happen to that population? Let me begin this by defining a term known as generation time. And that is the time required for a bacterial cell to divide. Another way of saying the same thing, time required for a bacterial population to double in numbers. And uh, Generation time is going to be influenced by the uh, environmental, the prevailing environmental conditions. Let's talk about E. coli as an example, right? Um, on the average, E. coli's generation time is about an hour. So what I mean is, is that on average, population of E. coli cells can double in numbers in about an hour. That's sobering, right? Now, let's say we have um, optimum conditions. Uh, we've just swished a loop full of E. coli into a fresh tube of triptych soy broth, placed it in the incubator, so conditions couldn't be better. It's a, um, a, um, um, a desirable temperature. Sorry, I lost my ability to speak for a moment there. The temperature is optimum. Oxygen is available. E. coli is a facultative anaerobe. There's no crowding, no metabolic waste products, uh, and nutrients are plentiful, right? So um, anyways, under those conditions, optimal environmental conditions, generation time is going to be even shorter. And for E. coli, it could be as short as 20 minutes. All right, now let's say that tube of triptych soy broth with E. coli has been in the incubator for, oh, I don't know, maybe a week now. And so uh, there's crowding, there are metabolic uh, waste products, including acids that have um, lowered the pH, so it's become more acidic. I would imagine that the oxygen has been consumed at this point, all right, so not good conditions. Under those conditions, E. coli's generation time is going to be longer, could be as long as 24 hours, right? So I hope that helps you understand how environmental conditions can have an influence on the length of generation time. Let's go ahead and take a look at this bacterial growth curve, and it's divided into four sections. Uh, so what we're looking at is, um, we're looking at a graph showing the number of bacterial cells over a period of time. And so if you take a look at that um, graph, you'll see that the number of cells does not begin at zero. Okay, so this, this corner right here would be zero, but a little bit um, above that, that's because when we inoculated that tube of triptych soy broth, we swished a loop full of cells into the broth, so we, we introduced some cells into the uh, media. So the first phase of growth is called lag phase, and this is a period of time um, after inoculation where we're really not seeing an increase uh, in the number of cells. Uh, so you can see that that line is, um, is straight and um, very horizontal. 
Now, even though the cells aren't dividing yet, there is intense metabolic activity. They're, they're gearing up, they're preparing to divide. Then we are going to launch into the second phase, which is called log phase. And the reason for that name is that growth is occurring at an exponential rate. Look at that graph there. Look at how quickly the population of cells has increased over a, a very short period of time. So conditions are optimum. So during log phase, generation time is at a minimum, all right? And uh, because the cells are dividing so rapidly, this is when they are most susceptible to adverse environmental conditions like exposure to antibiotics or um, ultraviolet light. It's also when the cells are at their most characteristic. Here's what I mean by that. This would be the best time to do a gram stain and get accurate results. Okay, so when you guys are working on your unknowns, uh, the lab tech Renee, make sure that the cultures, when you, when you pick your tube up out of the test tube rack, that you are uh, working with a log phase culture, that usually those tubes are between 18 and 24 hours old when you um, go ahead and start working with them. Uh, so log phase, uh, most susceptible to environmental, uh, adverse environmental conditions and um, most characteristic and generation time is at a minimum. Now you can see in stationary phase, which is the third phase of our, uh, our, our growth curve, the population has leveled off. Now, uh, so at this point, the number of cells dividing is roughly equal to the number of cells that are dividing, or excuse me, that are dying. Um, and um, there's still uh, some metabolic activity going on here, but things are really slowing down. And that's due to things I've addressed a few times now, um, crowding, accumulation of toxic uh, metabolic waste products, exhaustion of oxygen, changes in the pH, um, the temperature of the environment is increasing from the metabolic activities of the cells. And then finally, we will enter stage four, which is death phase. And at this point, the number of cells dying exceeds the number of new cells being produced until eventually no one will be left alive in this population. All right, thanks. I'll see you soon.